Thanks so much, Wright. Um, I was remembering back, I think it was about uh, 15 years or so ago since I've actually last uh, been here at SID. Uh, and uh, things have uh, changed quite a bit in our field. I have to say that um, over the past uh, three to four years, um, we've really, as a field, been overwhelmed to see the science of the immune system really begin to pay off uh, in successful immunotherapy. Uh, and certainly, uh, I'm very proud to be part of a large team of folks uh, at Hopkins that started getting interested in this pathway when we actually stumbled onto what's now called uh, PDL2, somewhat serendipitously. Uh, and began working uh, with a small biotech company called Metarex to develop some of the first antibodies that block this pathway uh, all the way through to um, the clinical trials that uh, really have, uh, I think in some ways, um, exploded the field. Um, so I got into the field of uh, cancer immunology based uh, on uh, really the fundamental principles that seem to me would make the immune system the ideal uh, anti-cancer weapon. Um, the immune system certainly has a great diversity of weaponry, at least 12 different um, methods of killing a cell. Um, from injection of granzyme B to, um, to production of reactive oxygen species, reactive nitrogen species, um, death ligands, etc. The immune system, the adaptive immune system, has precise targeting capacity, uh, more so uh, than any small molecule drug um, could offer. Uh, and uh, one of the most important and I think unique features uh, of the immune system pertinent to, um, to this is, is the capacity for memory. The notion that if you could induce the right kind of an immune response against a tumor, um, it would take over. You could stop actually treating with whatever drug or agent you were treating with and the immune system would then keep the tumor at bay. Certainly as um, cancer uh, genomics and expression profiling developed, it became clear that cancers overexpress many self antigens to levels that are sometimes 100 to 200 times that of their normal cell counterparts. They're loaded with mutations. So um, there's really no question that cancers contain uh, a level of cancer-specific or cancer-selective antigenicity that the immune system should have absolutely no difficulty distinguishing uh, from the normal cell counterpart. So it seemed that the immune system um, should be an absolutely straightforward um, system to activate to kill cancer cells. Um, that was an epiphany I had 27 years ago, and it turned out to be uh, a little bit more difficult than that. And um, what we learned from the science of basic immunology um, is that uh, tumor cells and tumors as an organ that is complex develop a microenvironment that is highly inhibitory to T cell killing and immune killing in general, even under circumstances um, where with a vaccine, one can certainly um, induce T cell responses in the blood that you can measure that have specificity or selectivity for the tumor. Um, and it really came down ultimately to defining uh, these inhibitory molecules that we collectively call um, immune checkpoints uh, that really uh, broke the field. Uh, now, um, as we, the field, 
uh, began to study uh, the tumor microenvironment uh, and immune regulation in general, we learned um, that there are lots of um, checkpoints. Um, what's shown here in this somewhat idealized slide and all of the uh, red circles represent signaling from inhibitory receptors that down-modulate T-cell uh, responses. Um, many of these actually participate in down-modulating responses from innate effectors, including uh, gamma-delta cells, which uh, now turn out really to be uh, innate effectors, NK cells, um, NK T cells, uh, and others. Um, these balance co-stimulatory signals, which are, um, which are the green um, circles. What's shown here probably represents only about 20% uh, of the total number of significant players, receptor, and ligand that modulate um, immune responses. And many of these can be found to be upregulated uh, in, in tumors. So you look at this, uh, and I have to say, as um, this began to emerge, it was a little bit frightening because one could imagine how difficult it would be with simply one or two agents that blocked one of these inhibitory pathways to actually be able to break through that, um, that gauntlet of, um, that checkpoint gauntlet that tumors set up in their microenvironment. Um, but nonetheless, you have to start somewhere, and um, uh, in part because uh, we had identified uh, one of the players uh, as a ligand for PD-1 because of some of the very original work from uh, Tsuku Hanjo um, showing that if you knocked out PD-1, uh, those animals eventually develop selective autoimmune phenotypes, suggesting that PD-1 is an inhibitory molecule. And then also the work of my colleague Li Ping Chen, uh, showing that um, PD-L1 uh, in particular uh, was upregulated in many solid cancers uh, relative to expression levels um, in uh, the normal tissue. Um, this certainly uh, seemed to stand out as an interesting uh, and potentially promising target for uh, blockade for immunotherapy. At the time we began this, uh, work had begun on blockade uh, of um, CTLA-4. Um, that looked like it was going to be tenuous because while there were responses in melanoma, uh, there was also a significant level of toxicity in patients treated with anti-CTLA-4, although ultimately um, clinicians managed to, uh, or figured out how to manage toxicities such that the anti-melanoma response, the, the clinical therapeutic activity ultimately out, was able to outweigh the toxicity, and anti-CTLA-4 was the first checkpoint blocker to be approved in melanoma. Um, that's the only disease that it will ever be approved in as a single agent, although may be very interesting in combination uh, with, other, um, with uh, other agents. Um, PD-1 and the PD-1 pathway really is a checkpoint that works primarily at the level of tissue. Its physiologic role is to mitigate collateral tissue damage when an immune system is ongoing against a microbial infection in that tissue. So you don't knock off your liver when you're making a response to a hepatitis virus infection so that you don't knock off your lung when you're responding to a pneumonia. Um, that's its primary role. And um, in keeping with that physiologic role, tumors have co-opted this system, overexpressing um, PD-L1 in the tumor and um, 
activated T cells, even against tumor antigens, be they endogenous or vaccine-induced, when they get to the tumor, they are upregulating PD-1 because all activated T cells will upregulate the PD-1 receptor. And um, so what monoclonal antibodies um, are, uh, are supposed to do and what now many of them uh, are successfully doing in the clinic is blocking this interaction largely at the level of the tumor. Now, um, as we began to look at patterns of PDL1 expression in the tumor, um, we, uh, one of the great pleasures that uh, I have being at Hopkins is working with Janice Taub, who's a dermatopathologist extraordinaire, who has really emerged uh, as one of the key leaders in this field, defining the principles um, of uh, regulation within the tumor microenvironment. And certainly, it's, it's, uh, she's, she's slowly turning me into, uh, into a pathologist. I, I actually enjoy spending lots of hours at the multi-headed microscope with her because there's so much that you can learn um, from, uh, from, from simple observation if you're really um, looking for the right thing. And what basically Janice saw very early on was that expression of PDL1 in tumors where it was uh, over, uh, whether, where it was upregulated was not uniform. Um, it was in particular areas of the tumor and generally associated with lymphocyte infiltrates. And so out of this initial observation and a lot of subsequent work that she did with Suzanne Tapalian, who led a lot of the clinical trials, work with our lab, um, uh, came this uh, real paradigm in the field that we call adaptive um, resistance. The notion of adaptive resistance, when, when this all started, the view of PDL1 upregulation in tumors was uh, this notion that uh, we call innate resistance, which is probably active but a minor mechanism for PDL1 upregulation in cancers. The idea was that this was a constitutive oncogene driven pathway. Adaptive resistance says that PDL1 expression on tumors and in the tumor microenvironment is really a reflection of a dynamic microenvironment, that it's adaptively induced by tumor cells, and we now know by myeloid cells in the tumor microenvironment, in response to the tumor sensing threat from an endogenous extant anti-tumor immune response. So where you see lymphocytes that are making gamma interferon, which is um, the primary but not only um, factor that drives um, PDL1 expression, that's where you see PDL1. Um, and in fact, the correlation um, is, is, is quite interesting. So if you look at PDL1 positive melanomas, and this is uh, from Janice's really seminal paper uh, published in Science Translational Medicine 2012, uh, virtually all those tumors have infiltrating lymphocytes. Um, there were actually two out of 150 tumors that had PDL1 expression without lymphocyte infiltration. These are what we consider to be the constitutive group. Um, among the PDL1 negative tumors, the vast majority of them did not have tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. There is a group that has tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, but you don't see PDL1 upregulation. And these are the tumors in which the lymphocytes are anergic. They don't make gamma interferon. So you need lymphocytes coming into the tumor, but those lymphocytes have to be active as determined by their ability to make cytokines such as gamma interferon, which any self-respecting activated Th1 or CTL will do, and then that's what drives the PDL1 expression on the tumor. So this is the dynamics that we have to understand are at play when we're thinking about therapeutics in the tumor microenvironment. So you can imagine, you might even predict that tumors that are PDL1 positive 
patients with PDL1 positive tumors will actually in general have better outcomes because that's a marker that there is an extant immune response that's trying to keep the tumor at bay. In most cases, the tumor ultimately wins, but in fact, when Janice analyzed uh, metastatic melanomas, Merkel cell cancer, and then David Rim at Yale did the analysis um, uh, correlating uh, outcome uh, with PDL1 expression in lung cancer, in all of these cases, Basically, if your tumor is PDL1 positive, no matter what therapy you got, you did better than if your tumor was PDL1 negative. So that already tells you that there is a key interplay going on. Now, the first set of clinical trials, um, again, led um, by Suzanne Tapalian um, uh, at, at Hopkins, this is actually res the results uh, of the second trial, demonstrated uh, clinical responses uh, in melanoma and renal cancer, but the big surprise was the clinical responses that we saw in non-small cell lung cancer, a cancer that was never supposed to be immunogenic, that the immune system was never supposed to play any role in, and should therefore never respond to any immunotherapy. But in fact, there were significant numbers of responses, and even more um, amazing to us, um, than the proportion of uh, patients responding, which still is a minority, it's still less than 50%, significantly less than 50%. But in those patients that responded, the responses didn't last for a few months like they do with chemotherapy or targeted therapy. These responses shown by the arrows here ongoing uh, lasted for years. This is actually uh, two years, this is three years, um, this is one year. Uh, in this clinical trial, anti-PD-1 was stopped after two years, that's the way the trial was written, and still uh, these, many of these uh, responses uh, are in fact are ongoing. In fact, the majority of the responses are ongoing even after you stop the drug. So this tells you that somehow Giving this antibody and blocking this pathway has really changed the immune response. Um, this is actually the three-year uh, survival rate uh, in melanoma uh, at 41%. This is uh, second-line therapy. Um, now PD-1 is beginning to be used in first-line therapy based uh, on a European study um, showing here. Uh, this is a younger study, but basically um, uh, the uh, one-year survival rate uh, in melanoma uh, to nivolumab, the first anti-PD-1 uh, antibody uh, to be developed, was 73 percent, and uh, so far that it really looks to be plateauing out uh, at 70 percent, which is just really quite astounding for patients with metastatic melanoma. If you compare that um, to pre-checkpoint inhibition days, the one-year survival for metastatic melanoma is on the order of 30%. So this is really making a difference uh, for cancer patients. The responses turn out to uh, have nothing to do with BRAF mutational status. Um, so this is a very different um, biology. Um, subsequently, uh, as a single agent, um, anti-PD-1 or anti-PD-L1 antibodies that seem to work fairly similarly have gone now beyond melanoma, lung cancer, and kidney cancer, but now to include bladder, ovarian, head and neck, gastric, Hodgkin's disease, uh, over 80% response rate, triple negative breast cancer, mesothelioma, Merkel cell cancer is joining that response category. In certain combinations, multiple, multiple myeloma, and there will be others. I've done the math. Um, it's really um, quite astounding, but this is turning out to be the most active single agent in the history of cancer therapy. Now, that sounds like gross hyperbole, but I actually went back and did the math based on number of patients affected with these common cancers, based on the durability of um, responses, um, and this really does seem to be the case. Now, we have a long way to go, because if you look here, the numbers 
uh, for most of these cancers are in the 20% range. So there's still 80% of patients that we don't generate formal objective responses to, although um, in many of these cancers, there are a large proportion uh, in which we stabilize the disease, and for immunotherapy, that does seem to be um, significant in terms of disease benefit. Um, so um, when I was uh, an oncology fellow, we learned that the three pillars of cancer treatment were surgery, radiotherapy, and chemical therapy. I propose that we are really now experiencing an era where um, immunotherapy uh, is being added um, as a, a fourth pillar. Uh, I hope that really does turn out to be the case, um, but I now say that with a little bit um, more confidence. Now, we still wanted to define which are the patients that are going to respond to our therapies. If your response rate is 100%, then you don't need a predictive biomarker, but of course it's not. In some of the early studies, this was work done with the very first immunohistochemistry assays for PDL1, worked out um, by Janice Taub, and working uh, with Suzanne Tapalian in that clinical trial I just showed you. They looked at the correlation between expression of PDL1 uh, on tumor cells in biopsies as measured by IHC with response rate. And in that first trial, uh, none of the PDL1 negative tumors, none of the patients with PDL1 negative tumors actually responded to anti PD1, whereas 45% of the PDL1 uh, positive tumors uh, had an objective response. Um, many studies have been done to follow up. This really has sort of launched a revolution in biomarker analysis. All of them have demonstrated that for monotherapy, if your tumor is PDL1 positive, uh, your response to a PD1 pathway blocking agent is going to be much higher than if your tumor is PDL1 negative. Now, for lots of reasons, the follow-up studies show that if your tumor reads out as PDL1 negative, um, it doesn't absolutely mean that you won't uh, that that you won't respond. It just means your probability are, is lower. And this is probably going to evolve such that this will be a biomarker not to exclude patients from therapy, but to prioritize therapies when there are multiple therapies available. This is going to be uh, this is really an ongoing. Um, learning process that uh, the field um, is, is, is very actively engaged in, but it was really all launched by this uh, very uh, initial dramatic um, finding. Um, in Janice's hands in, um, in melanoma, um, PDL1 expression by the tumor uh, is the most predictive, but other things, PD1 expression by TIL, Till infiltrate um, and PDL1 expression on immune cells all uh, predict for enhanced responsiveness. Um, again, as part of this inflamed um, microenvironment. So, why do tumors um, actually have what? What constitutes antigenicity of tumors that allows a patient's endogenous immune response to be unleashed to actually induce rejection of their cancer by simply blocking an inhibitory checkpoint. Um, well, early on, there was a lot of work on shared tumor antigens, tumor-associated antigens, such as cancer testis antigens, and these are going to turn out, undoubtedly, to be important. But with the um, uh, advent of exomic sequencing, um, it became clear that another source of tumor antigenicity are tumor-specific neoantigens created by mutations. But another very interesting and important source of tumor antigenicity, um, in fact, uh, I think are going to turn out to be viral antigens in virus-associated cancers. In fact, uh, Janice Taub did a very interesting analysis uh, in Merkel cell cancer um, demonstrating a very high proportion of uh, Merkel cell polyoma 
uh, virus positive Merkel cell cancers that are PDL1 positive. And you can see again uh, this expression of PDL1 both on tumor cells, uh, also on myeloid cells um, associated with CD8 infiltrates. Uh, remember that there are a subset of Merkel cell cancers that are virus negative. Uh, of the eight virus negative Merkel cell cancers that Janice evaluated, none of them express PDL1, and they tend to not have CD8 infiltrates. Um, Paul Niem in Seattle has done some very nice work demonstrating the existence of Merkel cell virus specific cell, um, T cells, and this has now launched a number of clinical trials that are beginning to demonstrate extremely high activity of both anti PD1 and also anti PDL1 antibodies in Merkel cell cancer. And again, I'm predicting that this is going to be another skin cancer uh, for which this class of agents will be approved uh, before the close of uh, 2016. Um, if you look at uh, this Broad plot, uh, ordering tumors uh, in the order of uh, mutational load, um, low mutational load, high mutational load, and you look at the histologies that tend to be more responsive to anti-PD-1, it in fact skews towards histologies that have um, a high mutational load, melanoma being uh, at the very highest. Uh, and in fact, um, when Tim Chan um, did an analysis of uh, clinical responders in melanoma, or at least uh, disease control or clinical benefit to ipilimumab, anti-CTLA-4, indeed there was um, a far from perfect, but nonetheless a correlation such that um, uh, the patients that had clinical benefit from anti-CTLA-4 on average had a higher mutational load than uh, the tumors in patients that did not have clinical benefit. Um, suggesting that one of the factors is in fact uh, mutational load. Now going to a non-skin cancer, um, colon cancer. Colon cancer typically does not have a high mutational load. And in general, from the clinical trials with anti-PD-1 antibodies, colon cancer was considered uh, a non-responding cancer type. However, in the very first small phase one trial um, that Suzanne Tapalian uh, developed and ran, uh, one of the first colon cancer uh, patients to be treated with anti-PD-1 uh, had a complete response. So we would call this the so-called exceptional responder. Now, um, since our uh, cancer genetics group is just one floor up and we interact with them all the time, uh, they, Bert Vogelstein and his colleagues, did uh, the f almost all of the first uh, set of, of exomic sequences, and they also uh, cloned the genes involved in uh, 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 mismatch repair deficient uh, cancer syndromes, particularly in colon cancer, Lynch syndrome, the question came up as to whether this small subset of colon cancers that are mismatch repair defective or microsatellite instable, which have about 30 to 50 fold higher mutational density than uh, the other 90 percent of colon cancers, whether they might be something special in terms of their immunogenicity. In fact, this exceptional responder, when we went back to the archives and analyzed their cancer, was in fact a mismatch repair defective or MSI high cancer. And um, in fact, if you look at the plot for colon cancer, um, there are really two groups uh, of tumors uh, based on mutational load. There's this group here, which is lower, but then there's this very high group here. And in general, these are the MSI colon cancers. In fact, if you compare MSI with MSS colon cancers for PDL1 expression, in fact, MSI colon cancers, which have a brisk lymphocyte infiltrate into their cancer, have lots of PDL1 expression. Interestingly, in this histology, mostly on myeloid cells, not on the tumor cells, but very little PDL1 in MSI tumors. And that actually 
led to a clinical trial led by none other than Luis Diaz, yes, son of that Luis Diaz, your Luis Diaz, um, which really uh, was uh, an amazing result. This is actually going to be presented in more uh, detail um, at ASCO. So even though this is colon cancer, we're keeping it in the Diaz fam dermatology family. Um, and essentially, um, what uh, Luis and uh, his colleagues found um, was, was really quite amazing. So the, uh, this is a waterfall plot, this is a spider plot. The reds here are the mismatch repair proficient colorectal cancers. These are the mismatch repair, repair deficient colon cancers. Uh, and then there was a third arm, which was a basket trial of cancers of many other different histologies that were mismatch repair defective because virtually all cancers have a subset that range from 2% in prostate cancer to 20% in gastric and endometrial cancer that are this mismatch repair defective subgroup that have between 20 and 50 fold higher density of mutations because they're mismatch repair defective. So, um, Basically, if you look at all these responders, they're all the mismatch repair deficient colorectal cancers and non-colorectal cancers. So this is now a genetic biomarker. These are tumors whose mutational landscape looks like a melanoma. Literally a thousand uh, or more mutations which probably translate into more antigens that just makes it easier for the immune system to distinguish them as being different. We actually think we can turn these uh, mismatch repair proficient low mutational density cancers into um, cancers that look more like melanomas by using combinations of um, therapies that create DNA damage and also inhibitors of the DNA damage pathway to try to first introduce mutations, make them look like a melanoma, and now um, they will be more responsive to immunotherapy. This is something for the future. But um, this is really where we are now, a subset of patients that we can, with immunotherapy, generate um, long-term regressions um, measured in many, many, many years. Actually, the first uh, objective responders in our first small clinical trial are alive today, eight years um, uh, from the time that they originally responded. Um, but we think we can, we hope we can raise this tail through biomarker-driven complementary combinatorial therapies um, and this is really what uh, we see for the future. And without question, skin cancer has always really led the way in terms of our understanding of uh, the relationship between cancer in the immune system and the capacity for immunotherapy um, beginning with melanoma. The amazing story is that it's now spread to the point where um, it may be that there is no cancer uh, that can't be made immunogenic, that a patient's immune system cannot be educated to recognize. So finally, um, just to acknowledge uh, some of uh, the key folks uh, uh, involved um, here, a lot of the trials, uh, again, led by Suzanne Tapalian, but also Julie Bramer uh, and Chuck Drake. Uh, this is Janice Taub, uh, really, who was uh, our pioneer um, tumor microenvironment um, dermatopathologist who's, who's really uh, sort of broken this field op uh, open together with our GI pathologist uh, Bob Anders uh, and a number of other key folks uh, uh, in the group here. Um, actually, we need to, I need to show a, a larger uh, picture because Hopkins has gotten so into cancer immunotherapy that we now would need a wide-angle lens to include all of the folks in our cancer center that are now involved one way or another as uh, this field has uh, taken off. So again, really thank you to, um, uh, to SID for the invitation, but also to um, to uh, skin cancer biologists uh, and cancer immunologists 
for really leading the way and keeping that flame alive to allow this explosion that I've been uh, lucky to be uh, a part of over the last few years. Thank you.